All right, so now we're going to be talking about motion in two and three dimensions. So we're going to be expanding what we did before, and we're going to have to use the full vector notation. So we're going to start with describing 3D vectors. So this is a little bit of a review from what we did in the second chapter. Um, it's the same concept, but we're, um, but we're really going to make you actually use the three-dimensional aspects. So we are going to use a coordinate system where we have the particles um, position. We always treat everything like a point particle. This is where you come up with the joke about physicists treating this cow as spherical. It's true. It also works pretty well in a lot of cases. So we are going to use this three-dimensional coordinate system, and we're going to describe the position of something in x, y, and z at the same time. For the time being, we are going to use Cartesian coordinates, which means we use x, y, and z. Later on, um, we will be using, uh, using a few different coordinate systems, especially if you continue on to more advanced physics classes. Okay, so we do this, and we have, you have some particles position. Then it, it, it has an x, a y, and a z. Now we have three axes, x, y, z. And if you remember back to unit two, if we take the cross product of a vector along the x direction with a vector along the y direction, it is going to give us a vector in the z direction. I'm actually going to introduce the concept of a unit vector. You've actually already been using this, even if you didn't use it, didn't know that you were. That's these, we say x hat is a vector of length one in the x direction y hat is a vector of length 1 in the y direction. z hat is a vector of length 1 in the z direction. So if we go back to our, um, we're going to try to define our coordinate system as right-handed, then we should have the cross product of x hat, it's a little bit above the vision, the cross product of x hat with y hat is equal to z hat in a right-handed coordinate system. So line your palm up with the x-axis, rotate it towards the y-axis, and it gives you the z-axis. And that's how we get a right-handed coordinate system. Note that if you did x hat cross y hat and it gave you the negative of the z-axis, we call that a left-handed coordinate system. Use your right hand whenever you are doing the right-hand rule. Um, and we're going to work from there. So usually, we are going to use a coordinate system with uh, x and y. Well, sometimes we, we do a few different things. Sometimes you put x along the horizontal um, along the Earth, and y is along the vertical. Sometimes you use z as the vertical. Like many things in physics problem solving, this is an arbitrary choice. Um, so it doesn't really matter which you do. It matters that when you do a particular problem that you are using the same definition of the coordinate system consistently throughout the problem. Okay, so now we are going to talk about displacement vectors. So if we go back here, we can define for this particle P that displacement vector X for the point, the X, the displacement for the point P is x, x hat, plus y, y hat, plus z, z hat. And that I mean, seems kind of obvious, but we have to explicitly write it um, so that we have our coordinate. And then this is x, p for the point displacement of particle p. We like using subscripts in physics. It also, there's a finite number of variables um, that we can use, so it, subscripts give you a few more options. It also helps you be a lot more explicit. Often when you're choosing what to name your variables, this is an arbitrary decision. Make it something clear. If you use something non-intuitive, then it's a good idea when you are writing your homework to define that for your instructor. So you're actually developing multiple skills all at once. One of your skills is solving physics problems. The other skill you're developing is writing an answer to convey what the, the, your solution is to whomever is grading. And if you've been using a lot of these online homework systems, they're great. They let you do practice really easily. And for instructors that don't have teaching assistance, they help you do assign problems with um, 
without teaching assignment assistance and actually get your students practicing, but they tend to be answer focused, not process focused. And as you move up in physics, you need to be much more process focused. So it's really important to that you're developing this skill for explaining your solution, which is the way you structure the answer to a problem. Okay, now we're gonna use this displacement vector. So the displacement of the vector P2 from P1, X of P2 relative to P1 is going to be the displacement of P2 minus the displacement of P1. Um, so here I can write x of P1 as x P1 x hat plus y of P1 y hat plus y plus z of P1 z hat. And I can write the exact same thing for P2. And here you can see how us physicists tend to go a little bit subscript happy. Okay. And then you could plug this in and write out an exact displacement vector. Writing it in general, long and ugly. It is good to have some way to know that you can write this in general. Um, later, when you get to more to a more advanced mechanics class, you're going to really have to work those um, those physics muscles a lot harder. All right, so you can draw. So here, this is two position vectors from the center of the Earth, and you can just like we did back here for two arbitrary points. I could write the same exact equations. Uh, I do want to note here, this is de defining the displacement as r. So you would have the position vector is x, x hat. r is x, x hat plus y, y hat plus z, z hat. OK. But same idea. You want the displacement um, between two different points. You just subtract the vectors. All right. You are going to need to be, you're frequently going to need to break things up into their components. So when you are given a physics problem, the first thing that you want to do is draw a picture. On that picture, you want to indicate your coordinate system. And then Usually, the first thing that we do is that we start breaking this um, vector up into the coordinates that we've chosen. And in this class, we're usually going to be using Cartesian coordinates. Okay, so here you can see some arbitrary vector that has length um, 12,509 kilometers, and it makes an angle of negative 67.5 degrees with the x-axis. So if I want to, so I'm going to draw that on this coordinate system. Ooh, that's a 45 degree angle. Not an artist. So here. All right, this is roughly what that vector looks like if I draw it right on top of the coordinate system. Remember, as a vector, we can move it around. It doesn't stay where we drew it. We just have to keep the magnitude and the, um, and the angle the same. Okay, so then I can, for, an, for this vector, I can write that that displacement, and here I'm going to use the vector x as the name of the variable for the displacement. That displacement is the magnitude of x times cosine theta, uh, the angle with where theta is the angle with the x-axis, times x hat, plus the magnitude of the vector sine theta y hat. And in this particular case, theta is negative. So I can write 
12,509 kilometers times cosine of negative 67.5 degrees x hat plus sine of negative 67.5 degrees y hat. Now, I want to use a, tr use a trig identity here, and I'm going to simplify this. Cosine of negative x, I'm actually going to use two trig identities. Cosine of negative x is equal to negative x. Sine of negative x is equal to negative sine of x. What this means, this is what we call an even function. What that means is that f of negative x is equal to f of x. This is called an odd function. And that means that f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. I'm introducing that concept because it's going to come up a lot more in physics classes. So uh, it, it also helps you see how to solve problems in many cases. So let's take it back up here. 12,509 kilometers. Now cosine of negative 67.5 is cosine of 67.5 degrees, x hat. And then this is minus sine of 67.5 degrees, y hat. Now, why did I do it this way? From our definition of theta, theta is defined to be the way that I have written this, theta for an arbitrary vector, Theta is positive uh, if you go in this direction, so up from the x-axis. It's negative if you go down. So if I use the um, if I use this definition of theta, then the fact that theta is negative comes out here, and I can use my trig identities to show that it's the same thing as if I use the fact that this angle is 67.5 degrees. Um, so I, but I want to do my sanity check. So here, I expect to have a positive x value and a negative y value. So here, this is positive. This is negative. That's good. You want to sanity check your answers whenever you're breaking a vector into its two components, um, because it is really easy to make we, let's call them careless mistakes. Those are the most common ki kinds of mistakes, or careless mistakes. So we're going to just double check that every time we're breaking our vectors into two components. So in these two-dimensional problems, that step where you're breaking a vector into its two components is usually going to be the first step that you do. Um, so you're going to start writing out your answer. You're, when you write out what you know, you're going to break whatever you have into its components instead of leaving it in terms of um, whatever the problem gave you. All right. So here you have, um, this is schematically some trajectory of a particle um, zipping around, and you can talk about the um, total displacements. So a particle starts out here, it gets knocked around, it goes, so its displacement now is from there to there, it gets knocked over to 0.5, its displacement is from here to here, sorry, it's from here to here, it gets knocked around again, its displacement is from here to here, Gets knocked around again. Its displacement is is from sorry. Its displacement is from there to there. So the total displacement is the sum of all of the different knocks that it gets, each of its different paths. So it, you you can break the path into multiple different segments. You're just adding the vectors along each path, or sorry, along the path up. You're adding all the the all the vectors up to get the total displacement. Um, so here. This is just 
saying what we said earlier in the it said for one dimensional motion, um, only it's a little bit harder to see. So now you've got this two dimensional, uh, you've got some particle moving in two dimensions. So if you look at its displacement at one point in time and its displacement a, a time delta t later, if you are looking for the, for instance, the velocity, remember that the velocity is the change in position over the change in time. So a small segment, delta change in position, goes like this. Now the velocity is going to be what happens to that vector delta r um, as you narrow delta t smaller and smaller. Okay, so then we're going to talk about free fall in three dimensions. So before we had our toolkit, and our toolkit of equations was x final equals x initial plus v initial t plus one half a t squared. Ooh, that just barely came. We're going to squeeze that just a little bit down so that you can see the squared. That's our first equation. Our second equation is v final equals v initial plus acceleration times time. And our third equation is v final squared equals v initial squared plus 2a delta x. For most of these problems, g, acceleration is negative g. Um, it can depend on my coordinate system. So I could choose to define, instead of defining y to be up, I could choose to define it to be down. Now, what's different here is that we have, this is our, this is our toolkit, this is our set of equations that we're going to use. So what I'm going to do is block this off and keep it up for most of these problems. Now we can treat motion in x and in y separately. So, sorry, we can treat motion which is vertical and motion which is horizontal separately. We do not need to treat everything, um, we do not need to keep the vector notation. Each of these equations is valid in the x direction. Change the x to a y and the same equations are valid. Now, in the horizontal direction, there is usually no acceleration in free fall. So we choose that the, the acceleration, if we put x here, acceleration along the x-axis is zero, while acceleration along the y-axis is negative g. Now, it can, the signs can change, and the definitions of the axes can change um, arbitrarily. I'm going to choose whatever is going to work. My tagline is, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. You're going to choose whichever coordinate system makes your job easier. You do not get extra credit for doing it the hard way. So you're going to look for the easiest way to do it. That also gives you uh, another, you know, sometimes you can see multiple ways to do it. If you see multiple ways of solving a problem, you can try solving it both ways. And then by looking at the, um, then they should be consistent. So if they are, if you solve it the same way and you get, solve it two different ways and you get the same answer, that gives you confidence that your answer is right. Unless you've made the same conceptual mistake in both approaches, but it at least reduces the chances that you are wrong. All right, so here this is showing um, how you do think about this when you break motion into two dimensions. So if you have a horizontal, we're just going to choose for the sake of discussion the standard axes where this is y and this is x. And when we do that, um, motion in the horizontal direction, there is no acceleration in the horizontal direction. So this is just going to keep going straight. Whatever you're doing, it's going to just keep on going. Um, that's also why sometimes when we talk about motion, sometimes we will talk about motion in one dimension, and we neglect the we neglect gravity. If you're talking about a hockey puck swinging, being shot across an ice rink, um, the gravity is still there, but 
because it's not actually causing the puck to go up or down, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so when we have constant acceleration, sorry, when we have no acceleration, we have constant velocity. So the, whatever is in the vertical direction is pretty much just going to keep going. Um, and then when we have free fall, we always have an acceleration of g, or we usually have an acceleration of g. We'll cover an example where it's decreased, but it's still, um, it's still constant. And then you're going to see the, the, accelerate, the velocity slowly gets larger and larger. Well, actually, it's pretty quickly. So that's what we're, that's the physical situation we're talking about. All right. Now, here is a classic example. We are going to actually neglect, for now, the rotation of the soccer ball and just consider it a point particle. Um, later on, we can talk about why you can, when we get to center of mass, we can talk about why you can, why you can approximate many things as a point particle. Um, but we're going to, uh, we are going to approximate the trajectory of this soccer ball as it, we're going to approximate the soccer ball as a point particle. Now, here, for the sake of um, for making a, the sake of making it a simple problem, we are going to start with. Let me choose a different color. Do this to highlight it. Um, we're going to start with assuming that so the velocity. We're going to. This is a an angle. Uh, this is somewhat different. So we're going to call this angle that the initial velocity of the soccer ball makes with the x-axis theta. Note that this is asking for phi, which is the displacement of the soccer ball at some end point. But we're just going to, the displacement at the beginning, we're going to call theta. So then this is the initial velocity the total velocity is a vector we can write as initial velocity cosine theta x hat plus initial velocity sine theta y hat. It's totally arbitrary. We are going to keep the coordinate system in this problem, x in this direction, y in this direction. And now we can, um, we're going to write that the, so we're putting the origin at the very beginning, so we have x initial equals 0, and this is the same thing as y initial. Uh, the acceleration in the x direction is 0. The acceleration in the y direction is negative g. So now I can write two sets of equations. I can write that the, final, the x position as a function of time, now I've changed x final to x position as a function of time because we're actually going to, there's not a final point. Um, and this is the initial x position, which is 0, plus the initial x velocity, which is v initial sine theta times time, I am actually going to move the time over here because then it's easier to make it's easier to make it clear that the time is not in the argument of the sign. And then the acceleration is zero. So this is my entire um, x position. It is the initial velocity times the time. My y position is my initial velocity in the y direction times time, and then minus 1 half g t squared. So from here, I, could add, I actually know the position of the soccer ball um, for all time if I want to write it. This gets written as a vector. It is, um, and I'll use r this time, written as a vector. It's kind of ugly because it is this mess. And then I can put the x hat there. 
and then plus this mess times y hat. Note how careful I'm being with where I put parentheses to make sure that I'm including everything that needs to be included. Okay, so then I can ask a number of different problems about this particular, I can ask a number of problems, I can, a number of questions, I can say, what is the maximum height that it reaches? So when it reaches its maximum height, oh, I can also write this, the velocity as a function of time, it is going to be um, the velocity, maybe I should write these, so I can write these as vector equations and say the position, the final position is equal to the initial position plus the velocity, the initial velocity times, oh, that's not clear. Let me write that just a touch lower. Basically, I can write these all as vector equations. So the final position equals the initial position plus the velocity times time plus one half times the acceleration times time squared. The velocity, um, the final velocity is equal to the initial, I wrote that as x and it should be v. plus the acceleration times time. Okay, I can't, I don't have a vector analog of this one. This one is derived from these two anyways. It's just derived by eliminating t from this thing. So these equations are the complete description of what we can do with vectors. Um, but that's the same thing as saying there's an x, you can write one version for x and one version for y. Okay, now if I want to figure out the maximum height of this soccer ball, um, in my x direction, my velocity is going to go to zero. So I can write my velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times time, which is just minus y hat times g. Now, at the top of the trajectory, the y components are equal to zero. So v i sine, oh, and I forgot the t there. Um, v i sine theta minus g t has to equal zero or I reach the top at vi over g sine theta. We're going to do a quick unit check on this. So velocity has units of meters per second squared, or sorry, of meters per second, and we are dividing by acceleration, which has units of meters per second squared. So this is meters per second times second squared per meter, which is indeed seconds. So I know my answer is right because I, or at least my answer has the right units. I still can make dumb mistakes. Or, um, I can make mistakes, but at least it has the right units. If it has the wrong units, it is the wrong answer. Um, okay, so this gives me the time that it reaches the top. And if I wanna figure out then how high it goes, I can plug that into here. If I want to, to, so how high it goes is um, y max equals v initial t, let's see, v initial times v initial over g 
sine theta. So I have a cosine theta, sine theta. Ooh, that's totally illegible. Let's write that down a little bit lower. Okay, so I have y max equals v initial squared over g cosine theta sine theta minus one half. I have g times v initial over g, so my g's cancel out. And I need a, ah, wait, I, so I, I'm gonna write this a little more carefully. So I have one half g times v initial squared over g squared sine squared theta. Okay, this simplifies with a trig identity that I don't know off the top of my head and I don't feel like looking up right now, but you can simplify this to get the, the maximum height. You can also ask questions like, how far does it go? So given an arbitrary, um, given arbitrary initial velocities, if you want to figure out how far it goes, um, you can take your arbitrary position. So now you want the y position to end up at zero. So you have uh, V initial T cosine theta minus one half G T squared equals zero because when, it, well, if we take this and then go ooh, figure out, we wanna figure out its maximum how far, figure out where it lands. That's for this equals zero. So you get V initial T cosine theta equals one half G T squared. One P cancels out and it lands at T equals two g v initial cosine theta and no divided by g 2v initial over g cosine theta what i was doing there is that i was checking my units so this has units of meters per second this has units of meters per second squared I have to get units of time, and I knew I had the wrong units, so I knew that I had to double check. I have to multiply both sides by two and divide by g. Now, you guys are not as quick with algebra. Speed is your enemy, slow and steady. Double check everything you're doing. Um, ironically, the better you get at advanced math, the more that your basic algebra chops tend to suffer um, because you know a lot more and you tend to go faster. Try to slow down and make sure, make, write out individual steps to make sure that you're not making sloppy mistakes. Okay, now this has the right units. That is when it will actually get back to zero. Um, and then I can plug that into the x equation. So the point where it lands is v initial sine theta times two V initial over G cosine theta. Okay, those were a few of the different problem, of the different questions I can ask. In general, um, I, can, I can give you, you know, I can ask how far does something travel? How long does it take to travel? Where does it hit in X? Where does it hit in Y? Um, you are told where it hits in X or Y and you're asked to figure out what the initial velocity was and what its angle with the axis was. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways that I can ask this problem. The, the ask one dimension or two, dimen two and three dimensional projectile motion problems. It can get really confusing to tease out what you start with and what you, what you know, what's given in the problem versus what you're trying to find out. So, 
That's why you always follow the strategy. Start by writing down, well, start by drawing a picture. Draw your coordinate system because that coordinate system is going to fix everything after that. If you do not draw down, draw your coordinate system, it is very easy to switch coordinate systems mid problem or you're comparing your answer, you're comparing your answer and your approach with a friend. They did it a totally different way. Your intermediate steps may be completely different. So it's important to draw that coordinate system. Then you're gonna start by writing down everything that you know and write down the equations you think might be useful and then you start algebra. So the hard part is not the algebra. The hard part is setting up the problem, drawing the picture, defining the coordinate system, writing down what you know. Um, and then the algebra part, if you've got all of that correct, the algebra part is just turning the crank. Okay, so, and this, this is just saying in, saying again, what we're doing for these, um, these two and three dimensional projectile motion problems is breaking the motion into com to three different components so that you're talking about motion in the x direction, the y direction, and possibly the z direction. And those, that motion is entirely independent. So you only have to consider one direction at a, at a time. Okay, so this says the trajectory of a fireworks shell. The fuse is set to explode the shell at the highest point in its trajectory, which is found to be at a height of uh, 230 meters and 125 uh, meters away horizontally. So from this, you could figure out what that maximum, what that velocity is. So let's try this. Um, I'm going to so our initial velocity is our, our initial velocity is v naught cosine theta naught x hat plus v naught cosine theta naught y hat. Now um, I am given so at we'll take the final position is going to be the top of the trajectory, the highest point has um, so the velocity equal to zero. So, so the, hot, the velocity in the y direction is equal to zero. Our velocity as a function of time is, sorry, our velocity as a function of time is the initial velocity minus one half g y hat. So the y component of our velocity is v naught cosine theta naught, I dropped my t there, minus one half g t. This occurs, so that top of the trip trajectory, the velocity in the y direction is zero. So I have v naught cosine theta naught equals one half g t. t equals two v naught over g cosine theta naught. Okay, now I am told that y the maximum y is 230 meters. So my y final equals h equals the initial y, which is zero, plus the y velocity, the initial y velocity minus one half g t. Oops, I need a t here. The initial y velocity times t minus one half the initial velocity, or one half g t squared. I tend to have a lot of verbal typos. That's just what I do. Look at what I'm writing. 
I'm editing when I'm writing more carefully. Okay, so that tells me what the height is. Um, I have the time when we reach that height, and I, I am ultimately after solving for this V naught, but I'm going to eliminate time. Or I could actually use this equation. This equation is going to be a little bit faster. So the final y velocity is 0. The initial y velocity is v naught cosine theta naught. So I'm going to square that to use this equation. And then minus 1 half g times 2, so minus g times the change in height, which is y. Okay, which is h. So this actually would let me solve for the initial velocity because I Solve this guy right here. I've already taken the square root. I did several steps there. The first thing I did is set this equal to, so it's equal to zero. So I moved the gh over here. When in doubt, write out more st steps. Do as I say, not as I do. Doesn't work for my kids either. All right, then I'm going to go ahead and take the square root because I can. And then I'm going to divide by cosine theta naught. Okay, so again, I could come up with multiple different questions that I can ask for a problem like this. How far did it go? What was its initial velocity? Um, how... Um, I can give you the initial velocity and ask how far it went. I can do problems. Any question you can think of to describe what, uh, what is going on, I can ask all sorts of variations on it. All right, this problem, very similar. The trajectory of a tennis ball hits into the stands. So now we are going to, um, the, now the difference is, so you want to ask, how far into the stands does it go? Um, and you can answer that by, uh, so we're going to do the same basic steps. So the, um, the initial velocity is 30 meters per second times cosine. I'm just going to leave it as theta x hat plus sine theta y hat. That's my initial velocity. My initial position, I am just going to set my origin at the origin of the ball. Um, there actually is the, the baseball player has some height, so it's not exactly there, but we'll say that the baseball player's height is Again, it depends on what your coordinate system is and how you draw that picture. It's very important. Okay, so we're going to ask how far from where it started does it end. So we are going to define the initial x position to be zero. So that's telling me that both the initial y and the initial, that's saying both the initial y and the initial z are zero. And then we know the acceleration. So the acceleration is negative g in the y direction. So negative g y hat. All right. Now I'm going to write uh, an equation. I'm going to write y as a function of time is equal to v naught, which I think if I want to make this more general and keep everything symbolic, 
I'm going to write V naught. You guys are chafing now, or keeping everything symbolic. I promise you, get used to it. It will pay off because it will make it easier to see your problems and to see your uh, mistakes and to check your work as you go along. Y equals V naught um, cosine theta times T and then minus one half V T squared. And this is going to be, we are looking for the height being, so when the height is 10 meters, um, and then the x position is v naught t sine theta, and that's it. So what you would have to do here um, is, well, you could do a few things. You actually could use this version. You don't know the final, uh, you don't know the final velocity. This version doesn't help you. You probably have to use the quadratic equation, solve this one for the time, plug that time in here, it gives you the distance. I do not have my calculator on me, so we're not going to do, and this isn't set up as a very specific problem with numbers, so we're just going to tell you the general way how to do it. Okay. So, more of the same. You're just setting things up, breaking things in, well, start. Draw, your, draw a picture, draw your coordinate system, start writing down everything you know. I like to keep the equation toolkit somewhere handy. Oftentimes in physics classes, including in my class, you can bring a sheet of equations to, uh, into the exam. You can develop that set of equations throughout the semester rather than leaving it to the very last minute. I can say that, almost no one will. Um, kudos to those of you who do. Um, as you do these problems, you want to think about keeping track of the equations you're actually using for solving problems. Um, so these are a big part of it. This is most of what you need for this chapter. Okay, so generally, if you, uh, so you can calculate the range, and this is basically, you know, you're, you're giving the initial velocity. We can calculate the, so you would just take the initial velocity is equal to, the velocity is equal to, the initial velocity is equal to the magnitude of the initial velocity, cosine theta x hat plus the magnitude of the initial velocity, sine theta y hat. Okay, so then you're looking for the range. You um, can write out your, so your acceleration is going to be negative g y hat. I am going to use this version of the equation. So your final x position is equal to your initial x position plus the initial velocity times time minus one half g y hat, the only one I plugged in there. So I'm going to set the initial position to be zero. So I'm gonna define my origin to be wherever the projectile shoots off from. I'm shooting exactly from the ground. And then here, I'm going to flesh this one out. Do, 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 do. Okay, running into the words there. So let me squeeze this just a little bit tighter. All right. And this is in the y direction. So now I have the y components have to equal zero. 
that's when it gets back to the bottom. V initial T sine theta equals one half G T squared. Now, I can pull out one of the solutions is obviously T equals zero. That's because it starts at the ground. And then I cancel one of the T's. The time to reach the bottom is two V initial sine theta over G. So that's how long it takes to reach the bottom. How far does it reach in X? It reaches V initial, two V initial squared over G cosine theta sine theta. So that is your range in this type of problems. So the greater the initial speed, um, the greater the range and the, um, and there's a, there's a maximum where the angle is 45 degrees, um, but there's two angles where, um, where you get, for everything but 45 degrees, there's two angles where you get the same range. Either it goes here, or it goes here, with the sounds. So you can talk about the range of projectiles, Fun fact, a lot of physics was actually developed to try to win wars and try to better maim people. But we can still, we can use physics for good. But that's why there's a lot of physics problems talking about projectiles and how you shoot things and then you add drag later. Um, because actually that was one of the first ways that you, one of the first applications. You can then calculate exactly where you need to aim something in order to hit. Um, okay, so this is showing two trajectories of a golf ball with a range of 90 meters. Um, and now, if you start saying with a given initial velocity, there's two angles that will give you the same, um, the same range, but you can also change the initial velocity. So you can come up with a near infinite number of sets of Initial velocities and angles, well, it is an infinite set. Initial velocities and angles that will give you the same exact range. Okay, moving on to circular motion. This is a special case of, um, of motion in two dimensions. And we're not going to use the same well, so most of the time we will not be using the same set of equations that we used when we were talking about projectile motion. The, um, sometimes you will use it if it is giving you the initial, um, the initial component of a given problem. So for circular motion, if we are going to deal in this class only with circular motion with a constant, um, with a constant velocity, so it turns out that the acceleration for something moving with constant velocity is v squared over r, something moving in circular, a circular direction with a constant velocity. So here, notice that you're, if you have circular motion, your velocity vector is changing. The magnitude of that velocity is the magnitude is constant, but the vector is constantly changing. So everywhere along here, the velocity has the same magnitude, but the direction is changing. And here you have a distance r. So your acceleration, when you have circular motion, the acceleration is always pointing inwards directly towards that center. And the magnitude of that acceleration for constant um, circular motion is V squared over R. So your velocity is always tangent to the circle. Your acceleration is always pointing towards the center of the circle. Um, and this, um, the, this is useful for a number of applications. So here, you consider a, uh, a 
projectile, you're trying to get a satellite to rotate around the Earth. So if you want it to go around the Earth and keep a constant, um, you want constant height, so that's the same thing as constant radius. So here, for our circular motion, this is our R. Let me, so this right here is R, yes, this is R, and then um, we have, we need our velocity, so how fast do you have to shoot it? So to get it to, to rotate around the Earth, your, uh, you need the acceleration to equal the gravitational constant G, and then that initial velocity needs to be V squared over the radius of the Earth. So the velocity, um, now this is assuming that it's roughly at the height of the Earth because this number changes with distance from the center of the Earth. But we haven't gotten to that unit yet. So to get something to be, to get a satellite to go around the Earth, you need the velocity to be g square root of g times the radius of the Earth. Um, and that turns out to be about 8,000 meters per second to get a satellite to go around the Earth. Now, if you go up, you reduce the, the gravitational constant. Well, it's not a constant at that point. Um, and you can actually change the speed because you're changing the size, the magnitude of gravity. But we need to talk about gravitation in general before we get that. For this unit, you're assuming constant. Um, so you've got constant um, acceleration to get a circular motion. And that acceleration is always g squared over r. OK, what's going on here? So you've got the same, the magnitude of the velocity vector in any give, at any given point is the same. So here I can draw a couple different lines to get to the position at different points in time. Um, and this delta r is the distance between those two points. I'm going to shrink delta the change in time as small as possible. And eventually, I would get that the delta r is roughly like this. Um, so that's giving my, me my instantaneous velocity, which is delta r over delta t. And then your acceleration is going to be the change in velocity. So here you can see we're going to shift this vector over here. We're going to move this vector over here, and the chain, the acceleration is equal to the change in velocity over time. Um, so here you can see that the acceleration is pointing toward, now we shrink the, um, if we reduce the time, we are going to slowly squish those vectors closer and closer together, but the, the delta V is still going to stay pointing in the center. So when we have motion in a, con a, in a circle with a constant velocity, you are always, your acceleration always points towards the center. This is called centripetal acceleration. Um, I am going to write this out. The important part here is centripetal, not centrifugal. Centrifugal is different. Centripetal, so pointing towards the center. Um, centripetal acceleration involves the acceleration pointing directly towards the center. So acceleration is in the radial direction pointing towards the center. And the velocity is tangential to the circle. 
for circular motion. Um, and we aren't deriving this because the math gets a little bit hairy if you're taking calculus concurrently. Um, so take this at this point as a given. Your position vector for uh, circular motion is going to be r cosine omega t x hat plus r sine omega t y hat if you start at the origin. So I am like the hand, my hand is like the hand on, of the clock. I'm starting here at t equals zero, I'm at zero. And I sweep out a constant circle and my x position is always going to be r cosine omega t and my y position is gonna be r sine omega t. Um, the angular frequency is in radians per second. Um, that is um, how many, so that's how many radians you sweep out. Um, radians are actually one of these unitless quantities. So if you have, if you are, are giving an answer in radians, it technically is unitless. We usually write radians as a way of keeping track. So radians per second, times seconds is a unitless quantity. When you are calculating a function of a number, it should generally be unitless. Um, so the argument of a sine or cosine should be unitless or else you have a mistake. If you are taking the exponent of some number, it needs to be unitless. Um, so in this case, the particle is moving counterclockwise by convention, we have the angle being positive if you are moving counterclockwise. Stick with that convention. There's no reason to use anything else. If you stuck with, if you went with the opposite convention, everything would be off by a sign. Okay, so here this is just showing a more specific case where you have a particle moving in a circle. Um, Sometimes it seems like these examples that we use in intro classes are totally useless, but I promise you that there's a reason why they do all of this. This motion, actually, circular motion of a charged particle is really common. We use this in, uh, in particle detectors to measure how fast things are going because, it, because you end up with the, um, the acceleration is equal to V squared over R, then if you know the magnetic field, which, I mean, which we haven't introduced yet, if you know the magnetic field, you can calculate the acceleration. And if you know the acceleration and can measure the radius of orbit, you can measure the velocity of the particle. It's really, really important. So here, as in, this is one of the things my experiment does. Like, charged particle moving in a magnetic field moves in a circular orbit. This is how we measure velocities. We do it all day in, day out. So it's not just some dumb arbitrary example, it is used in practice. So here you can see the trajectory of a proton. They have it ar arbitrarily starting here at 200 nanoseconds. You can then define the position of the proton at any given point in time. Okay, this is another figure showing that the, um, ah, you have, so if you have a particle speeding up, you can also have a tangential acceleration. So you have something moving in a circle and it's speeding up. The centripetal acceleration always points towards the center. This is equal to V squared over R, but you can get an additional tangential acceleration and then your total acceleration is not towards the center. The tangential acceleration is moving in the same direction as the velocity, so it's going to increase the velocity. Um, so you still have v, v squared over r in this direction, and then you have some additional component in this direction if you've got a particle moving in a circle and speeding up. Um, and the total acceleration is the sum of those two vectors. So in general, if you're speeding up or slowing down, then, this, um, then the total acceleration is the sum of the tangential acceleration and the centripetal acceleration. All right. 
relative motion. So this is one of those things that's going to seem to you like it is just something we're throwing in at the end to make your life harder. It's not. If you stick with physics, you're going to learn relativity, most likely next year. So um, this, is, <laughs> this is describing uh, what happens if you have classical motion, um, and you're talking about describing relative, uh, how particles move relative to each other. When you get to the development of relativity, Einstein's big uh, insight was that the speed of light is constant in all, um, in all frames of reference. So what he did is he looked at the classical equations for um, relative motion in two frames of reference and went, ah, but if I make the speed of light constant, then, um, then it turns out that the length, that lengths and distances, um, distance and time actually are not constants. And that was his big insight. To get to that, you have to know how to, you have to learn how to crawl before you can learn how to walk. We are going to talk about relative motion classically, where you are, for instance, talking about you're walking along in a train and your friend sees you through the window. Um, what is your position? Uh, what does your friend see your position as compared to what you see it as? Okay, so in general, if you're talking about the velocity of something, uh, let's say a velocity of uh, a particle on the, the, the on a train, I'm throwing a marker, I'm on a train throwing a marker up and down, the velocity of that marker is the velocity of the marker relative to the train plus the velocity of the train relative to the earth. So here I see the velocity as only, I draw my coordinate system, x, y. Here I see my velocity as the velocity only is in the y direction. And actually we're going to stick with primes. This is the, the frame that is moving. Um, if, and the one frame that is not moving is the unprimed frame. So. This is the earth, and this is the train. So on the train, the marker goes up and down, up and down, and there is no x component. I am riding on the train, and I'm tossing the marker. You see me toss the marker while the train moves, and you see that the marker has some x component. That's because the, so if the, in that case, the train has some velocity relative to the earth, and the velocity of the marker that you see is the velocity relative to the train plus the velocity uh, of uh, the train relative to the earth. So if the train's going this way, I've got a train going this way, and I am walking this way, you still see me so the train's going this way. I might be walking, let's see if I get this right. I am walking this way, but you see, I can't do it perfectly because I don't have someone pulling me. You see me going that way, but I think I'm walking this way. I'm moving on the train, but I'm still going with the train and the train's faster than me. So that is, again, the velocity of the person with respect to the earth is equal to the velocity of the person with respect to the train plus the velocity of the train with respect to the earth. So you add these together, you get rid of the t's and you get the p's. This is just a way of keeping track of what those subscripts mean. Okay. So, you can in general have the position of, so this is these frames. This is the S frame. This is the S prime frame. The moving frame is the S prime frame. So, we're going to talk about the motion of, so you, the motion in the moving frame is the motion in the front prime frame. 
motion in the stationary frame is the unframed primed frame. So this, let's see, that actually, a, a big example, you got an elevator. Um, you have a person standing on an elevator. The elevator is moving. You are on that elevator. In the elevator, you think that you are, um, that you are not moving, but someone watches you and they see you moving. We're going to talk about in the next chapter. We're going to talk about what that does to your apparent, um, your apparent acceleration. All right, and this is just an example of um, two another example of two-dimensional motion where you can, um, where the system is both of them. So here, you are in that car, you are moving relative to the earth, and the truck is moving relative to the earth too. Um, so the relevant, um, if you're considering how much you're going to get hurt, the relevant quantity is the total velocity, your total velocity relative to the truck, not the earth. And so you can add these, um, these vectors, the velocity of the car relative to the truck is equal to the velocity of the car relative to the earth, plus the velocity of the earth relative, of the truck relative to the earth. All right, and that's the end of this chapter, and we'll see you guys next time when we're going to start talking about force diagrams. Thank you.